Today I want to tell you all uh, a story. He remembered proposing to her. He couldn't remember whether she said yes or no. <laughs> Have you sat with anyone? Today in our uh, in our presence we have the um, a God fearing man, Amen. a man called uh, for the ministry of the gospel who has been very effective for God. <coughs> Pastor Jonathan Park is the secretary of the Southeastern California Conference. He has been now in the office for four years. Four years, and he has done phenomenal work. Uh, 
He came in as the Vice President for uh, Asian Pacific Ministries and uh, then became the Secretary of the Southeastern California Conference. He is my boss. He's a great man. Amen. Great man. Uh, he cares about uh, we as us as pastors. Um, he is a great advocate for us and he's also a great advocate for these churches. Amen. Um, he cares about the growth of the Adventist work and I want you all to understand you all are in, are, are, are in, are in no better hands <laughs> um, than Pastor Park. So um, with no further ado, um, I know that he has basked in the presence of God this week and that he has partaken of the bread that he will break for us so that we might be able to partake and eat as well. Amen. So with no further ado, uh, with your prayers, we will now accept the word that Pastor Jonathan Park has prepared for us. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Yes. It's good to be here. I have passed by this church many times. The reason why I say pass by is because my parents used to live here for about 14 years. And that's when I was pastoring at Glendale and then way out in Spencerville, Maryland. So I always remember saying, oh, there's an Adventist church here. I uh, never got to visit because I was only visiting during weekdays. But <clears throat> it's good to be here. Yeah. Let's see, does this uh, appeal my work? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> Again, my name is Jonathan. I, I was made in Korea, and I got imported to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 10 years old. And God has blessed me tremendously with beautiful wife and three kids. Yeah. My oldest daughter is at Palau, serving as a missionary for one year. Yeah. My son just graduated, well graduated, and he started at Southern Adventist University as a freshman. And I'm youngest one, uh, eighth grade, at, La um, where, where does he go? Redlands Adventist Academy. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Okay, now it works. There's a, there was this elderly gentleman who was married to his spouse for 40 years. Lived happy, they loved each other, unfortunately she passed away. So he was feeling lonely. And eventually his children recommended him to move into a retirement home. Oh, he did not want to do that. He didn't have friends there, he, he didn't want to he felt that he could maintain himself. He, did, he lived on by himself for a few years and then he realized that he needed community. So he moved into retirement home. And to his surprise, he got to meet lots of new people, made good friends. And then he met this special lady, fell in love. One night he proposed to her, he went back to his room and slept. Next morning he got up. And to his surprise, he remembered proposing to her. He couldn't remember whether she said yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> so he did what any one of us would have done. He tried to relive that experience, didn't work. He went to that courtyard where he proposed to her, sat at the same table, rehearsed the whole thing. Couldn't remember if she said yes or no. He thinks she said yes, but you want 100% assurance that she said yes. <clears throat> so with great embarrassment, he went to his, uh, her apartment, knocked on the door, she came out, and he put his head down, very embarrassed, and says, honey, you know I love you. I know I proposed to you last night, but when I got up this morning, I couldn't remember whether you said yes or no. Honey, can you tell me one more time? <clears throat> and looked up, she had this big smile on her face. And she goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> I remember saying yes last night. But when I got up this morning, I couldn't remember who I said yes to. <laughs> I am so glad it was you. <laughs> they live happily ever after. We all, we all laugh because we could identify. Yeah. But what is important is that there are certain things one should never forget. Yes. However, if you remember when you first 
gave your life to Jesus, when you met with Jesus, when your heart moved, when the mission was clear, you remember that day. And as we live our Christian life as an Adventist, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there are times we forget why we're here. Yes. Next thing we know, coming to church is good enough. Next thing we know, intention, in good intention of waiting for Jesus is good enough. Many times we get away with good enough, a good intention alone. We think that is a core of our message. When it's not. past 30 years, our society, actually worldwide, we put so much emphasis on leadership. We tell our kids, when you grow older, you be a good leader. I remember my dad telling me, Jonathan, don't be a tail, be head. Amen. That's what we want. You go to Barnes and Nobles, you look at, I remember 20 years ago or so, you see book on leadership in basically one bookcase. <clears throat> now if you go, it's filled with rows and rows of how to be a good leader. It's about leadership. But if you look in the scripture, in fact, King James Version, when it first came out, may I remind you, it did not have the word leader or leadership in the Bible. I don't know if you noticed that. The first original version of English Bible did not have a word called leader. It went all the way until revised standard version that you see four times mentioning leader. Because the word leaders, leader is a very Western word of vocabulary actually. Jesus is not about leadership. Amen. As much as we like to and as, as we label Jesus as a leader and we, we follow this Jesus' leadership principle and then we need to become leader. May I remind you, the first thing Jesus asked of Peter is not be a good leader, yeah. but he was follow me. Amen. The last thing that Jesus told Peter is not you become a great leader after I'm gone. But he said, follow me. Beginning and end, you see Jesus saying, follow me. And many times we as Christians, we believe that we need to be good leader. People, leader is a result of becoming following, followers of Jesus first. Amen. Because without following Jesus, we become leader, we become power hungry people. Yes. Church is not about exercising our leadership, but it's about exercising healing, exercising serving others. Amen. Were you able to get a bit, uh, picture? Okay, it's all right, it's my bad. Whoa, I, I did not see this. <laughs> there it is, this ceramic, Kinsukuriyo. Now, in 15th century, there was this famous samurai. He received a special gift from China, a beautiful piece. And he treasured that like none other. In fact, he would even have his servants uh, put dust away from that ceramic, that big, vast vessel. He himself did it. But one day, somebody knocked it over and cracked. He loved that vase, he treasured that vase, uh, vase so much that he, he took it to China to fix it. And they couldn't fix it. So he brought back to Japan and went to the most famous ceramist and says, can you do anything? So he put that vase, uh, that ceramic together. <coughs> and instead of making as if nothing happened, every crack that he put it together, 
Fill up with gold where the special substance where it glues together. Mm -hmm. So I wish you could see it. When you go home, Kinsukuryo. Well, actually, if you have a smartphone, you could just uh, look it up. It's, it's a, if you see a ceramic, beautiful glazed ceramic, you see this line. And you can see that it's gold. In between is gold. That's what church is. We're not here to pretend as if our lives are broken, but nothing is broken. Because we all look good. But we're all broken vessels. Yes. Amen. And it is Jesus using his righteousness love mixed with your love. We put the substance together Amen. and we all become that kiss of Amen. Face. That's what we do. That's yeah. what church is. But in order for our church to be that way, we need to be busy serving. Mm -hmm. And that's today's passage, John chapter 13. The John chapter 13 is about what we call Last Supper, or communion service. If you open your Bible to John chapter 13, it happened, this, this took place on Thursday, a day before Jesus died. And he knew that he was going to die. Mm -hmm. Let me, may I ask you a question? Let's say you went to a doctor, and your doctor tells you that tomorrow you will die. 100%. You will die. What are you going to do next? Are you going to gather your friends to watch football tomorrow morning? No. Are you going to talk about our government, politics, no. Medicare, whatever it is? No. no. None of those matter anymore. No. You will gather those that you love. No. If I was sentenced to die tomorrow because of some Illness. As much as I love you, you're not the person that I will call you. No. My wife, my kids, my immediate family, and I will bring them together. Amen. And I will relay something that is most important in my heart. I want to sit, share things, I want to say things to my kids that without my presence, that for the rest of their lives, they will keep it. Do you agree? Amen. So tell me, Jesus spoke about a whole lot of things. He spoke about money. He talked about relationship. He talked about a whole lot of stuff. But here he is, Thursday, a day before he's to die, and he gathers his dis disciples. It has to be something that's most important in this life. So he goes on, on verse, um, chapter 13, verse 1. He indica it indicates, it was just before Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So he knew. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Full extent of his love. In other versions, he says, love them to the end. But I like this uh, NIV version of 1984 where he says, full extent of his love. What does that look like? You ever wonder, what does full extent of his love look like? Verse 3, Jesus knew that Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So in this moment, Jesus was the most, uh, most important, most powerful person because God the Father had given him all the power to his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who is the most powerful person in this church? Is it your pastor? Is it your first elder? Somebody with the loudest voice? No. Who has most money? No. Most educated? The founder of this church? No. Many times, when I say who's the most powerful person in this church, we could all think of a different people. Here was this room. 13 people, while disciples in Jesus. Jesus was already the most influential, powerful person in that room because he's the rabbi, he's the Messiah. But this particular verse, verse 3, indicates that he's the most powerful person, not only in that upper room, but Jerusalem, Samaria, 
Palestine, the whole world. If you are the most powerful person, what will be your next step? We're busy telling other people. <coughs> but here's Jesus in verse 4. When, when Jesus recognized that, well, Jesus knew, but when he is the most powerful person, the very next thing he does is, so, he is the most powerful person in the universe. The very next verse says, so, he got up from his meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with towel that was wrapped around him. Wow. When I imagine a powerful person, this is not the picture that I imagine. It's somebody that goes to the pulpit that preaches, that somebody to stand before lots of people and make difference by his or her speech. It's that person that stands up and says, charge, and everybody follows. That is a powerful person. But here's Jesus. Upside down kingdom. You want to lead? Be a follower. You want to live? You want to die. You want to be first? You have to be the last. Upside down kingdom. Here's Jesus telling every single one of us the power that is given to you is not to instruct other people, but is to get down on your knee and start watching. So when Jesus started doing that, you see verse 6, Peter saying, Whoa, are you going to wash my feet? That doesn't make sense. He was surprised. And verse 7 is this, you do not, uh, Jesus said, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later <coughs> you will understand. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus knew that after he died, Peter one day will get up and preach, and 3,000 people will give their lives to Amen. Jesus. And that happened time after time after time, where you see, you, you see that Thousands upon thousands of people were converted into Christianity because of Peter's preaching. Amen. I don't know about you, but there's a huge difference between 10 people following you and let's say 10,000 people following you. Mm -hmm. When you have lots of people giving you a full, undivided attention, your shoulders get wide, you get big head, you think you just became somebody oh, very important. Yeah. So imagine with me, Peter. When he was disciples in Jesus' time, all the attention went to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He was just one of those who assisted. After Jesus resurrected and went to heaven, when he preached and saw that 3,000 people became Je uh, Jesus' follower because of what he said, and you go on and on and on, next thing you know, you could think Peter going, hey, I'm pretty good. That's when he probably remembered verse 7. <coughs> saying, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say that I am to serve? Amen. Didn't Jesus say that what I am to do is to wash these people's feet? Mm -hmm. May I remind you, our Seventh-day Adventist structure, many times we have it upside down. In fact, Pastor Anthony got it wrong. I am not his boss. Amen. He is my boss. Amen. Only reason why conference exists is to serve church. Yes. Not the other way around. Mm -hmm. If anybody tells you that conference is above church, remind them about John chapter 13. Amen. Mm -hmm. It is the body first. Amen. Is church. Is conference. Conference exists to serve the church. Mm -hmm. The union exists to assist the conference. Mm -hmm. Division exists to serve the unions. Mm -hmm. GC exists to serve the worldwide churches. Yeah. It's not the other way around. Many times, you think, as lay people, 
that you are to be led by pastor. No. No. We journey with you. Amen. We journey. Amen. So here is Peter that realized, whoa, I am not leading these people. I am simply journeying with them Amen. toward the same mission, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. So you have, so we as a church, we are to have that mindset. Yes. There was this interesting research that was done by UN. They wanted to know how they could define poverty. Actually, this is from a book. North American audience, when they ask homeless people, when they ask people in poverty in North America, this is what they found. North American audience tend to emphasize a lack of material things such as food, money, clean water, medicine, housing, etc. When we ask people in general what poverty is, many times how we responded to that question is they're lacking this, 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 lots of material things. But when they actually went and asked poor people in North America, this was their response. Poor people typically talked in terms of shame, inferiority, powerlessness, humiliation, fear, hopelessness, depression, social isolation, and voicelessness. Do you see the difference? When we define poor people as who's lacking these things, so we as a church, what do we do? <clears throat> we give them things. But what they really need besides things, we are to be voiced because they are voiceless. We are to give them respect because they feel deprived of uh, respect. It is just more than material things. I'm not saying let's not give material, let's not share material things. What I'm saying is, helping our neighbor goes beyond just sharing Amen. material things. Respect, love goes far. So when I share with you, a church ought to be church where we serve people, it's not just giving things. It's becoming their voice. It's becoming their pride, where we give hope, and so on. <clears throat> You are to value them, the humility, in humility, you are to serve them just like Jesus served his disciples with love. Amen. We are to serve. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us here are powerful people. Pastor, do you have to have? <clears throat> I'm going to give you a short, simple illustration. Many times, we, people in North American Division, North America Division, we always wonder, at least I wonder, why is that God's miracle always happen to be in Africa, somewhere in Asia, South America? Why is that we don't talk about miracle of Jesus? My son said, that's because we're not poor enough. Mm. Yeah, I can see. Although, not everybody in Asia and Africa and South America are poor. Amen. But there is our perception. But I believe there is a different reason why we don't experience miracle. When God, when I look at myself, many times what I think is, boy, I wish I'm this full. So when pastor or elder or somebody comes up to you and say, can you please lead out Sabbath school lesson? I look at myself and go, you know what, pastor? I only have, I only have this much of knowledge, knowledge of the Bible. When I know enough about the Bible, <laughs> then I will lead. Mm -hmm. Pastor, I would love to give more financially. 
but I only have this much. Mm-hmm. When God blesses me, I say He doesn't be, He has blessed. <laughs> and I have enough money, then I will give. I only have this much time, <coughs> Pastor. When I have this much time, then I will give. Mm-hmm. So our mentality mm-hmm. is when I am ready, yeah. keyword, when I am ready, then I will serve. From Genesis to Revelation, nowhere does it tell us that your cup needs to be full in order to serve. Amen. Nowhere. Amen. All God asks from every single one of us is whatever you have, yes. share. Amen. Pour yourself into somebody else's life. Mm-hmm. Do you follow me? Yes. I do not have ability to fill somebody else's life. God never tells us, fill this person up. We don't have that much righteousness in us. Okay, We don't have that much love in us where I could make this person whole. It's that's job of Holy Spirit. My job that God asked me is, Jonathan, you don't have much. But all I'm asking you is share yourself with somebody else. So let's imagine. I come here in this sanctuary, empty as I can be. I only have a drop or two. Mm-hmm. We come, and if I'm saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, how much of spiritual food can you receive in half an hour to fill your cup? Not much. Mm-hmm. Not, much. <laughs> Not much. But, a little bit of it, yours, a little bit of yours, and a little bit of yours. If we start emptying ourselves, I always have to do a holy magic here. <laughs> Next thing we know, our cups are full. Amen. The reason why our cups need to be full is because as soon as we walk out of that uh, double door, we need to be busy pouring ourselves Amen. to people outside of this church. Amen. If our Christianity is limited to mm-hmm. this building, people here were in trouble. People outside of this church is waiting, wanting to be full by our love. Amen. But it's not going to happen unless we start pouring ourselves to each other mm-hmm. here, and thus outside of worship time, we start sharing people outside of this. Amen. Boy, your cup, the water that stands still and don't move for a long time, there's a reason why many of us stink. Yes. Yeah. But if we keep sharing, if water keep moving, that water stays fresh. Amen. Amen. And through the miracle of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, that life gets renewed Amen. every time we share. Amen. Then you start seeing, experiencing Amen. what miracle is like. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I remember when I was youth pastor, just fresh out of uh, PUC, I went to a small church to pastor. And one of the key questions that our leadership team asked was, how can we witness? And there are shy people. So I threw out something that was different, I guess. I said, why don't we start praying for our guests? And of course they said, how do we know who our guests will be? I said, you know what? We don't. Amen. But let's start praying for our guests. That when they walk in, they feel warmth, that God will Amen. bless them, that they will experience who God is. <clears throat> that idea was suggested six months after I got there. And boy, before six, uh, six months before that, six months after that, we saw a big change. The difference is, first six months, guest was only a guest. I never prayed for that guest. So we did what we normally do. Welcome. Have a great Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Goodbye. Yes. But when people started praying throughout the week for that, for that guest who may come, and I see a guest that comes in, I've been praying for that person for a whole week. Amen. I just didn't know it was that person. And there was that connection. So people start in their head going, I pray for you all week. So there's that warm, genuine, authentic warmth, welcome as 
our members approached that guest. And that guest evidently felt it. It was more than welcome, happy Sabbath, goodbye. Even if the same phrase was given, what they experienced is, boy, these people really welcome who I am. Why? Because we pray for them. This church, this church need to continue to grow. Amen. Because of Jesus Christ. Is Amen. Amen. We will grow yes. because you will continue to serve. Amen. So if you if you keep going, you see that these, these disciples got it. They understood what it means to be Christian. They understood what it means to be powerful people. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you to look at each other and say, you are a powerful person. You are a powerful person in the name of Jesus. <laughs> okay. All of you are now powerful people. So what are you supposed to do? Share. You're supposed to serve. That's what power people do. Power pe Sir. Powerful people do. By the way, this is first church I actually saw that worship service start before 11 o'clock. <laughs> wow. So I asked half the Anthony, how, how long do you guys go? It's like 12.30. Really? I'm supposed to preach for an hour? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I've always wondered. I was pastor for a Korean church for a long time. And we keep time. Just like many of multi. By the way, in our conference, we don't call Anglo church anymore. How many churches are pure Anglo? None. We call it multi-ethnic church. Amen. And then there's Amen. ethnic churches, of course. But in Korean church, when I preach, 12 o'clock, we're done. We always have pop, so we got to finish at 12 o'clock. <laughs> I always wonder where Holy Spirit went after 12 o'clock. <laughs> And then I came to conference, and I started out going to different churches to preach, and I went to black church to preach. And I realized, aha, uh -huh, Holy Spirit goes from Korean church next to black church. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the pulpit of black church at 1245. Yeah. <laughs> and then they wouldn't let me come down until I preached 460 in 90 minutes. <laughs> so, okay, and now I know where Holy Spirit goes. <laughs> We're not gonna go that long. <laughs> but I like to wrap it up with a, a story, one of my favorite stories. I love telling stories because ever since I ever since I could remember, I always practice my sermon before I come to preach. And then I got married, I had my kids, and when my kids were old enough, I will actually practice my sermon in front of them on, on Friday. Mm -hmm two weeks before it is uh, to give it. And then my son got older, so one day I remember him coming to my room, he goes, Dan, is your sermon done? I go, yes. I said, can I read it? This was when he was like 10, 11. So I go, sure. I gave it to him, my, my page. My, my sermon basically is a full manuscript, color-coded outline. <laughs> <laughs> so my son read it, he came back, <laughs> And he goes, he gave it to me, so I go, how is it? He goes, you need to work on it more, Dad. <laughs> I go, why? It's good, it's just not good enough. So I go, okay, so I worked on it more, I brought to him, and he read it again, and he goes, nah. Go, what do you need? So I'm like, Dad, your sermon is boring. <laughs> I wish you were never born. <laughs> like, what's wrong? It's like, your sermon is boring. You gotta put some more stories. So I went and got more stories and put it in. He read it mm, better, but you need more stories. I go, Brandon, I can't just tell stories after stories. He goes, why not? What do you mean, why not? It's a sermon. He goes, Dad, do you know why kids like Jesus? Mm -hmm. Why? Because he told parables. We relate. I, I could listen to your sermons, but when the stories I walked out, I remember two, three weeks later. But no stories, it's same old, same old. Yes. So I put more stories, put them in, he goes, it's doable. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually, this sermon, I don't have that many uh, uh, stories, but I'll wrap it with a story. Amen. In New York, there is this school. At, at, uh, at New York, and special students, 
uh, school for students for those with disability, uh, you know, different uh, stages of the, their kids' life. It's just a special school for special students. Do you know what I mean? Yes. In the year, they had a banquet to honor the uh, the teachers and staff. So they had this banquet and they were recognizing different teachers and different students. And father got to, uh, father went up and he started sharing. He starts talking and he said this, where is the perfection in my son Shia? Everything God does is done with perfection. But my child cannot understand things as other children do. My child cannot remember things like other children do. Where is God's perfection? Boy, that large hall became quiet very quickly. Yeah. If God is so perfect, why do we have such imperfect children? And he continues. I believe that when God brings a child like this into the world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to this child. Amen. I'm going to read it once again. I believe that when God brings a child like this into this world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to this child. Amen. And he starts sharing his story. One day, Shia, his son Shia and father, they decided to walk around um, their com uh, community and they passed by a park and there he saw, they saw Shia's age friends playing baseball. And Shia looked up to his dad and says, Dad, do you think I could play baseball with them? Shia's dad knew that Shia never played baseball, never mind the athletic. He never touched bat, he never touched glove. He probably doesn't even know rules of baseball. And who would want to let Shia play in their team? So he was just about to say, no, nah, let's just move on. But when he looked at Shia, Shia looked up with this expectation, just wanting to belong. So he went up to the fence and shared with first baseman, hey, is it okay if my son played baseball with you? And the first baseman kind of looked looked around his friends for some kind of affirmation. None was given, so he just made an executive decision. He said, sure. We're in the eighth inning. By the way, baseball is ninth inning. We're top of eighth inning. Excuse me, bottom of eighth inning. We're losing by six points. Mm. But you could come and play with us. So he found, he, you know, he gave Shia a glove that he never put on and put it in a short center field. And here's Shia with his glove, not knowing what to do, just standing there. They got it out, and now it's top of nine day. The opponent did not score. They're still losing by six points. Bottom of nine. Shia's team starts scoring. One point, two point, three point, four point. They're only losing by two points. Mm. And Shia's dad heart just sank because he was two out. They're losing by two points. And guess whose turn to bat? Shia. Shia. <laughs> And in his, in his thinking was like, they're not going to let Shia bat. This is the last opportunity for them to score. By the way, base is loaded. Wow. <laughs> no way. Mm -hmm. But to his surprise, they let Shia bat. Amen. So here is Shia with his bat. First time holding a bat, just waiting with the ball. All pitcher have to do is throw three quick pitch mm. and game over. They went up on. But instead, he took a couple of steps forward and gently allowed the ball. Amen. Shia swung, missed it completely. Shia's teammate came out and held the bag with him. Amen. And here's pitcher once again, took a couple of steps forward and gently allowed the ball. They both swung, barely hit the ball. Ball came slowly ro rolling right from the oh. pitcher. All pitcher had to do is pick it up through the first base, they would have won. Yes. But instead, he picked up the ball and threw way over first baseman. 
And Shia's team says, Shia, run to first, run to first. Shia had no idea where the first base, first base was. So the catcher said that way. So he ran and ran and ran. When he got to first base, first baseman told him, go to second base. So he's running by this time. Right fielder came, was able to grab the ball. All he had to do is throw to second base, yeah. tag him out in the play. Yeah. But he understood the intention of the um, pitcher. So he again threw way over third base. <laughs> so when, he, when Shia got to second base and stood there, the shortstop came and says, Shia, go to the third, go to the third. When he rounded the third base toward home, both Shia's team and opponents, all those kids ran behind Shia. And when Shia hit the home base, they all gathered around him and said, Shia, Shia, we won Grand Slam. Amen. Amen. And Father concluded that message by saying, that day, that day, those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'll repeat that again. That day, those 18 boys reached God's perfection. Amen. We, all, we may all have a different definition of what God's perfection may be. But I am here to define simple as a perfect love of Jesus Amen. is something that we could accomplish Amen. when we reflect God's love to other people. Amen. And when that happens, when that becomes real, <clears throat> this church, there's no reason why Jesus will be real for Amen. There's no reason why Jesus cannot be real to our children. Amen. Doctrine is important. Tradition of Adventism is important. But none of those matter when we are not serving each other Amen. and have base Jesus' love in our lives. Amen. So it is my challenge to you, it is my prayer to you that this church will reflect God's perfect love. Amen. This Amen. Let us all stand for our last hymn. B three seven. B.
May we fix our eyes on you. May we long for your second coming mm -hmm. and prepare not only ourselves, but our neighbors, people around us, with the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he died for us 
because he loved us. He went through the pain of making sure that we had a second chance at life, making sure that we can make it to heaven, making sure that all sin would be done. So just like Marjorie's mother who had ugly hands because of the fact that she wanted to save her daughter, Jesus loved you enough to die and to go through that pain so that you too could have a second chance. Amen. So, for this week, as we go throughout the, this new week after today, I want to encourage you all to always remember that you always have a second chance. That when you make a mistake, it's not the end. But that Jesus loved you enough to always forgive and to die for you so that he could be in relationship with you. So he could hang out with you and just love you. So always know that his love is enough and that you always have a second chance. Is there anybody who would like to